اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین و بہی نستعین والصلاة والسلام على خیر خلق اللہ ابی القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین اما بعد فقد قال اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی فی کتابه الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم ادعو الى سبیل ربک بالحکمت والموعظت الحسنة پلیز ریسائٹ الصلوات ریسپیکٹڈ لسنرز مائی دیئر برادرز اور سسٹرز السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ Today, I would like to start by sharing with you a true story. There is a practicing Shia Muslim family who lives in one of the European countries. And one day, their young daughter returned from her school a little bit sad, a little bit anxious a little bit morose and the parents asked her what happened and she said that she has a couple of class fellows of Sunni Muslim origin and one of them said to her why are you Shia and said to her According to the Quran, it is not allowed to be Shia. And that really disturbed her. And she asked her parents, is this really true? That it is not allowed to be Shia? Is being Shia something really bad? The parents, of course, said to her, no, no, of course not. Nowhere does it... Uh, Mention nowhere in the Quran is mentioned that it is not allowed to be Shia. But the thing is, those innocent children who said that to that little girl, they did not learn it on their own. 9, 10, 11 year old boy, 9, 10, 11 year old girl, where did they learn that from, that thought? their parents or maybe they listen to it in the mosque they attend because children are innocent but it's not only the children it can be adults as well most people around the world they adhere to and believe in something that they have simply inherited and they vehemently defend it and those who are not from their own school of thought vehemently criticize them and attack them but the reality is very few people very few religious people and in particular very few Muslims in fact do self-reflection and try to understand why they are Shia why they are Sunni, why they are Sufi, why they are Salafi, and so on and so forth. Shia, Sunni, or Rafidi, what are you and why? This is the topic of today's lecture and I have carefully selected this topic after much deliberation because this can be seen as something as an attempt to create sectarian divisions exacerbate sectarianism use this arena for hate speech and i can understand that some people might find this topic not very apt for this occasion but let me tell you this is an extremely important topic it depends how we approach it and in the current circumstances the kind of worlds we live in 
we have to approach and address this topic with the utmost respect and keeping in view what's going on in the Middle East, all the atrocities being committed against the Gazans, the people in Gaza, it becomes even more sensitive to address this topic. So I want to say, before I tell you what I'm going to talk about, that throughout the lecture, I'm not going to make any attempt, deliberately or inadvertently, it's not going to happen that someone feels offended. This is not the intention. This is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do either. And I recited a verse in, of the Holy Quran, a part of a verse in the opening sermon in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal maw'idatil hasana. Call towards the path of your Lord with wisdom and the best advice, the kindest of advices, that is the way to approach this topic or any topic, but more so this topic. So what you're going to learn during the next 45 or so minutes is the following. First of all, first of all, what are the terms of reference for this topic? Before we even start to look at this topic, what is the framework? We have to set a framework and the terms of reference. And that's very important because this topic can go in all directions. So we have to establish that first. Briefly, after that, what is the major point of contention between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims? What is the major point of contention? And I'm not going to defend the Shia faith when it comes to all those false accusations that the takfiris make against us. Like the Shia are mushrik, they are kafir, they believe that prophethood continues and all those, those things. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do an academic discussion on what is the main point of contention that differentiates Shia Muslims from Sunni Muslims with focus on succession to the Holy Prophet. Who was the successor to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That is the major point of contention and I'm going to take a closer look at that and an in-depth discussion to a certain level because in limited time we can only go so much deep. After that, what are the origins of Shia Islam? Is it something of a construct by Abdullah ibn Sabah, like some people claim or falsely accuse? Or, no, it has some profound origins and roots in Islam. A very important discussion. And after that, what is a Rafidi? I have included the term Rafidi because recently, more and more takfiri oriented people use this word in derogatory terms for Shia Muslims and more and more Shia Muslims are embracing this term as their identity, as a pride. So what is a Rafadi and should we be identifying as such? That's what will be the bulk of this lecture, these three things that I've discussed and after that. I will take a look at history and before doing that sum up the discussion and reach a conclusion and how we should approach these topics and also something to take home whether you are Shia or Ismaili or Sunni or you identify as Rafidi what is it that you can take home that's what I'll briefly discuss and then talk about history and give the historical accounts of some of the events that took place just before the Battle of Karbala and on the day of Ashura and end this lecture with a brief eulogy, inshallah. But before I proceed, wherever you are, you who are blessed to be present here and those who are blessed to be watching this program live, please recite a wholehearted and beautiful salawat. Allah. 
So, setting the, setting the framework and the terms of reference for this discussion, Shia, Sunni, points of contention, the origins of Shia and so on. One more disclaimer, personally, personally, I have Shia friends, sorry, I have Sunni friends, many of us have Sunni friends, we have Sunni colleagues, we have Sunni family friends. Some of us are even married to Sunni Muslims. My nanny was a Sunni Muslim. And I pray for her every day to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because she passed away a long time ago. I do not live in a sectarian bubble, nor can I afford hate speech, nor do I want to do that. Now the terms of reference and the framework. First of all, we have to bring arguments in the light of reason and aql because both Shia and Sunni and even non-Muslims believe in that. We can only discuss this in the light of things that both believe in. And I cannot simply sit here and talk about my books and my books and my references without listening to the point of view of Sunni Muslims. So we have to set this framework. First of all, aql, both believe in logical arguments. We'll take a look at this subject from that perspective. After that, the Holy Quran. Everyone believes in the Holy Quran. Both Shia and Sunni believe in the Holy Quran. After that, the ahadith of only and only the Holy Prophet Because the definition of hadith in Sunni Islam is only the hadith of the Holy Prophet. I can't put forward arguments on the basis of hadith by one of the Shia Imams. Because then it does not really make sense in this context. So that is very important to understand. The hadith of the Holy Prophet. And even when it comes to the hadith of the Holy Prophet, it has to be found in both sources. You can't say I'm referring to Al-Kafi or I'm referring to Muslim or Bukhari. It has to be found in both sources for it to really work in such a discussion. So this is the framework. At most respect, no hate speech. The intention is not to hurt the sentiments of anyone. Purely academic discussion with open mind and open hearts. And those things that both parties believe in. Now, now what's the point of contention? The major point of contention is who should have been the successor, the Khalifa, to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Because all Muslims believe in the Holy Prophet. Now before we can talk about that, we need to look at the roles of the Holy Prophet in Medina after having established the community in Medina. What were the roles of the Holy Prophet? First role of the Holy Prophet and all his roles were divinely appointed first Rasul, his job was to receive the messages from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then propagate them, do the tabligh to the Muslims and non-Muslims and explain the sharia and all that. And all Muslims believe that that door has been closed. That door has been closed. After the Holy Prophet, no one, no one receives revelation no one receives any messages from God. No, that door is closed. This is our belief. This is the belief of all Muslims. Now the second role of the Holy Prophet was, was marja'iyah diniyah, technical term. Marja'iyah diniyah means religious leadership. What does that mean? It means that people would turn to him and ask their questions related to the Quran. What does this verse mean? How should I act upon this rule? What is the rule when it comes to traveling? 
marriage, divorce, this, that. So that is basically tabijin, explaining the religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, litubayjina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so that you, to the Holy Prophet, so that you explain it, do bayan, explain it to the people, Muslims, non-Muslims. So that is the second role of the Holy Prophet. The third role of the Holy Prophet was marja'iyah siyasiyah, political leadership. Political leadership, when to go to war, how to defend the foreign policy, all the political aspects of Muslims' affairs, that is political leadership. Now, as I said, the Risala is closed, Nububwa is closed, Prophethood is closed, that door. No one can do that after the Holy Prophet. What about the religious leadership? and political leadership. Sunni Muslims believe we do not need any specific person with certain qualities to be the religious leader after the Holy Prophet. Because we have the Sahaba and all of them are just and we can follow any of them and take the religion from them. The Shia point of view is that no, we need to understand the Quran we need to understand the religion after the Holy Prophet from someone who has ilm, who has the knowledge and who is divinely appointed. This is the point of view of Shia Muslims. So there is one difference there. And then the third, political leadership. Who should be the successor to the Holy Prophet when it comes to political leadership? Implementing the laws of the religion in the society. That is also part of that. Now, Sunni Muslims say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not devise any method for that. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi did not recommend any method for that. When he passes away, after that, it's totally up to the Muslims to select a leader for themselves. Shia Muslims believe this is not the case. This is not the case because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam to be the successor of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So that is the major, major point of contention is that succession. The things about the basic beliefs, the differences in uh, fiqh, all those things came much later. The major point of contention is who should be the successor to the Holy Prophet. Now let's take a look at it. First of all, on the basis of aql which both parties believe in. Remember three things we have to keep in view. First, aql, then Quran, and then Hadith. So, according to the reason, should the Holy Prophet alayhi, have appointed a successor or not? What does your aql say? What does your reason say? You see, I said in the beginning, open minds, open heart, no fear. Don't be afraid to think and think critically. Don't be. I know in this audience there are Sunni Muslims as well. I say, don't be afraid. Allah does not want us not to think critically. Allah rather wants us to think critically. And you are not going to hell for that. So <laughs> relax and think. Logically speaking, according to the, to the reason, what should have happened? The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, should have appointed even in worldly terms when a president leaves the country is out of the country someone takes his or her place vice president or someone as an acting president you can't leave a society a country a community without a leader even for a day even for a day and the holy prophet sallallahu did not do that so this is first question, and very important question. The second thing is that, let's assume 
that the holy prophet really did not appoint his successor. Let's assume for a second that he did not appoint his successor. Now it is up to the Sahaba to pick one leader for them. According to logic and reason, who should be the leader of the Ummah at that time? What kind of attributes that person should have? It's, it's a very logical question. So if you are a Sunni Muslim, for example, and you live today, but I want you to imagine you are a civilized person, you are a highly educated person, you are an open-minded person, don't be afraid, imagine and go back to Medina after the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and assume that Allah did not devise any method, the Holy Prophet did not devise any method for select selecting, did not appoint any successor and now you think who should be the leader, who should be the caliph, who should be the successor to the Holy Prophet, what should be his characteristics, what are the criteria maybe the most knowledgeable one, maybe the wisest one, maybe the one who really understands the politics very well, the one who is honest, the one who is just, and the one who is the bravest. These should be the criteria. And then look who fulfills these criteria. And if you come to the conclusion that yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib had all these qualities at a much higher level than all other Sahaba and you reach the conclusion, yes, I think Ali should have been the Caliph. And you imagine and you say, yes, but wait a minute, we can't rewrite the history because Abu Bakr was the first Caliph and you believe that he is the first Caliph, but now you have reached the conclusion after a careful analysis that Ali should have been so you can easily start believing that now as well it doesn't hurt anyone it's not dangerous or anything you're not going to end up in hell for that because this is simply a logical exercise but you say no 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 I need a proper proof at least on the basis of the Quran because I'm a fallible person I can make mistakes so let's take a look at the Quran. Does the Quran give any criteria for the leadership? What are the key characteristics of someone who should be the leader of the Muslims or the believers? The Quran tells us clearly, clearly. You see the stories in the Quran are not for pastime activity. The Quran is not a story book. We look at the story of Goliath and King Saul. Goliath and King Saul, when the Beni Israel wanted to go and fight Goliath, they, they went to their prophet and said to him, according to the Quran, please appoint for us a leader. Now their prophet did not give any answer straight away. He didn't. He didn't say, I appoint for you a leader. He didn't say that. He waited. Then he said, then he said, Allah has appointed Talut to be your leader. Allah has appointed. The Quran is very clear. He could have said, I like this man. I like Talut. No, it's not my decision. I don't have the power to appoint my successor or your leader. Leader of the Ummah. Leader of the believers. So this gives us one principle. Leader of the believers has to be appointed by Allah. Even the Holy Prophet himself cannot appoint him. That's principle number one from the Quran. Not from my pocket. From the Quran. Principle number one. You will say Shia always bring the stories of other prophets. So why are those stories in the Quran? Why are they there? For what? To have fun? To tell children bedtime stories? To fall asleep? No! They are exactly for these reasons. So number one, you can't appoint. It's not in your hands. Second, those people said, we have a lot of wealth. You are appointing Talut? Poor man? 
Then their prophet gave another answer. He is more in ilm and jism. Another two criteria. Allah is telling us the leader has to have two things. Two things. Ilm and jism. Ilm means knowledge. And jism means body, which is strength, bodily strength. Now that does not necessarily mean a very strong physically, but that can also be translated into bravery. Shaja'ah. Someone who is brave, who can lead from the front, who is not a weak person. So we've got two criteria here. Knowledge and bravery. Now you again go back to Medina. The Holy Prophet has just passed away. And you say, Allah did not appoint any successor, we think. The Holy Prophet did not appoint any successor, we think. Let's look in the Quran. What does the Quran tell me? Well, the Quran tells that Allah should have appointed a successor of the Prophet. And he should have had knowledge, the most knowledgeable one and the bravest one. So you got these three things. Then again, you use your aql. Be brave. Don't be a slave to the beliefs of your forefathers. You don't have to be. Be free. Open your mind. Closed minds have to open up. Otherwise, they will suffocate. They will rot away. Open. Don't be afraid. No problem. And also, if you are Shia, do this reflection. Do not simply inherit your faith. Do not do that. Allah does not want that. So that you got. And you say, okay, how do you know? Ali had the most ilm. Well, then let's look at the hadith. The hadith, famous hadith, Ana Madinatul Ilmi wa Ali Babuha. The Holy Prophet said that. Both Shia and Sunni believe in that. Very clear cut. So what is it that you are waiting for? Oh, what about bravery? Well, uh, do I really have to talk about that? Do I, do I really? <laughs> I know many, many Sunni Muslims love Imam Ali salam. They believe Ali was the most knowledgeable one. They believe Ali was the bravest. But somewhere along the history, someone introduced a principle of a taqdeem of a mafdool on afdal. This is a Sunni principle. Taqdeem of mafdool on afdal. They say yes, a mafdool can also be superior to afdal in certain circumstances. What does that mean? Which means that someone who is uh, inferior can be in a higher position than the one who is superior under certain circumstances. Although all the Sahaba were inferior to Ali in ilm and bravery, however, it was okay to appoint Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman first instead of Ali because Ali was too young. Ali was too kind. He used to joke around. And therefore, we can appoint Mafdul on top of Afdal before him. So then again, use aql. Does that make sense? Age. Nowhere does in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention age as the criterion for leadership that a younger person cannot become the leader of the believers, for example. So, ilm. No question about that. Absolutely. But okay, you say this is hadith. I believe in the hadith, but uh, how do you know Ali had that ilm? Maybe even this hadith is not correct. So let's look at the Quran. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about characteristics of individuals. Not always does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention names. There's, there was a time when someone doubted the prophethood of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say, قُلْ كَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنِ وَبَيْنَكُمْ وَمَنْ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْكِتَابِ O Prophet, say to those people who doubt your prophethood that Allah is sufficient to be my witness between you and me 
and he also is sufficient to be my witness who has ilmul kitab now a thinking mind someone who is not a slave of the opinions of others slave of the judgmental religious scholars who is a free thinker will question who was that person he's a witness allah says say to those disbelievers i don't need your witnesses you say i am not a prophet i don't care allah is sufficient to be my witness and he who has ilmul kitab the knowledge of the book who is that person allah could not be that he has already said allah is sufficient and the one who has ilmul kitab he is sufficient the holy prophet himself couldn't be that how could he be his own witness so it means it's a third person who is the witness of the holy prophet allah says he is your witness who has ilmul kitab who was that was he the first caliph abu bakr who was he the second caliph umar was he the third caliph uthman was he the the prince of syria muawiyah was he any other sahabi who was he you have to ask this question the quran is before you we didn't make it up who was that person who had the ilm of al-kitab and which al-kitab some people say al-kitab this quran no no it is not this quran because in another verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that asif ibn barkhiya the successor or the wazir or deputy of prophet sulaiman alayhi salam had ilmum min al kitab he had some knowledge from the book some knowledge of the book on the basis of which he brought the throne of queen sheba from yemen to the levant in the blink of an eye before the blink of an eye and he clearly did not have the knowledge of the quran because quran hadn't been revealed back then so what is that al kitab so this is something much greater than the quran something from which the quran comes maybe the lawh mahfuz maybe the ummul kitab so if a person has ilmul kitab that's why that person is the witness of the prophethood of allah so the prophethood of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi. who is that person i'm not saying he's ali you go and do your own research we believe he was ali how how can we say that how so we look at the hadith again you will say i don't believe in that hadith but that hadith is found everywhere ana madinatul ilmi wa ali babuha again ali again ali you can decide if you have already decided you do not want to believe in ali it's okay okay i'm not gonna fight with you i'm not gonna sever my ties with you if we are mates we are gonna remain mates but this is an academic discussion this is my point so ilm clear bravery as i've already said i mean i don't even have to really talk about that people believe that so my brothers and sisters this is the point of contention and we all need to learn about these things on a rational level on the basis of aql on the basis of quran on the basis of hadith before we can really start to progress spiritually because simply inheriting these things is not going to help much it's not going to increase our ma'rifa of the Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam. The purpose here is not to create a sectarian division, not to hurt the sentiments of anyone. But yeah, we are Shia for this reason. Because we have done our homework. The logic tells us, the hadith tells us, the Quran tells us. Now people say no, this is not correct. Because the Sahaba, they were all Adil. So let's take a look at the Sunni point of view. Because all Sahaba were Adil. And that's why someone can say, no, I, this, you know, this is all you Shias, you are good at speaking. You bring this argument, that argument. No, 
we have heard all of this, your mullahs speak about these things. No, no, the point is the Sahaba gave sacrifices. They were all adil. And Islam believes in democracy. And you Shia, you believe in hereditary politics. Valid question again. Hereditary politics. And also you Shia come up with all these things. So I say, okay. First, were the Sahaba Adil? What does Adil mean? Adil means the one who doesn't commit any sins. But we know that the Sahaba used to commit sins. And it is all right to think that they used to commit sins. So, the point is, the Sahaba used to commit sins. And it's okay. No one is sin free. They were not fallible, infallible, they were fallible human beings. Who decided that Sahaba could not commit sins? They used to fight one another. They used to sometimes curse one another. They went to battles and fights with one another. For example, Muawiyah went to fight against Ali. Right now, the thing about our Sunni Muslim brothers and sisters is that they have a very positive approach, and I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that they have sincere intentions and they do not really want to judge anyone, they want to make sure that they love the Sahaba and they are willing to give them concessions. They're willing to give them concessions, and they say, You know what. This was an ijtihadi mistake, a, 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 a judgment, error in judgment, error of judgment. He shouldn't have done that, Wahabiya, that he went to war against the fourth caliph, Ali. But it was just a mistake. And that's the thing, because there is a mindset in Sunni Islam, as I said, very positive approach and a, and a little bit of fear of going to hell. If I, if I, and I, I really I beg your pardon and I ask for forgiveness if I'm judging my Sunni brothers and sisters, but this is my impression. So if I am wrong, please correct me, get in touch with me. A little bit fear. If we criticize the Sahabi, we might end up in hell. No, you won't. You won't. Take it easy. They are, who are Rajulun wa anta Rajul? They were men, you are men. They were fallible human beings, you are fallible human beings. They made mistakes, you make mistakes, we make mistakes. So Muawiyah went to battle against Imam Ali salam, and they say it's ijtihadi mistake. Then Lady Aisha, the wife of the Holy Prophet, went to war against Ali and our Sunni brothers say, it's, it was an ijtihadi mistake, an error she made, which she regretted later on big time. And she used to cry with tears when she recited the verse of the Quran, وَقَرَنَ فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا That stay in your houses. Then she realized she had made a big mistake and she would cry so much so that her cloak would soak in tears, which means she went against the Quran, which is a sin. Now, is this an insult of the wife of the Holy Prophet? No. It's just an ac academic discussion. She showed remorse, which proves that she was not infallible. Now, some people say the Shia slander against the wives of the Prophet. The Shia say this, the Shia say that. No. According to our maraja, it's not allowed to do tawheen of the wives of any prophet. Tawheen, insult, tawheen, and falsely accuse them. The, the fatwa is, it's not allowed to do tohma. That's the real fatwa. It's not allowed to lay tohma on the wives of any of the prophets. Tohma is haram. Tohma is what? Attributing lies to someone, falsely accusing someone. Fatwa says it is haram. If you are falsely accusing any of the wives of any of the prophets, you have committed a haram. And we take distance from that. We don't do that. So the point is whether it is the Sahaba 
or whether it is the wives of the Holy Prophet, the Quran does not say they were infallible. Nowhere. Where did you get that idea from? However, when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt, the Quran is very clear. In Ayatul Tatahir, إِنَّمَا جُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِجُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَّهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا So you see, since you have to become free, that's what I say. And the Shia also have to address these topics with respect and the intention. Make it a meaningful activity. If the intention is only to hurt the sentiments of fellow Muslims, it's not a meaningful activity. You are playing into the hands of shaitan, which some Shia hate preachers do. Their intention is not mawiza hasana. Their intention is only to create fitna and do cheap point scoring. Cheap point scoring. This pulpit is not for that. No, it's not. But also, then there are many, many takfiris who have become cunning now because takfiri has become an insult now. So they say, we don't say Shia are kafir. We don't say Shia are kafir. We only say that Rafidi are kafir. <laughs> That's a very cunning way of doing things. They said, not all Shia are kafir, it's only the Rawafid who are kafir. And then they say, if someone believes that prophethood still continues and the Imams are like prophets, that is kafir. Shia are not kafir. They are insinuating, insinuating, very cunning, very cunning, playing into the hands of shaitan. All sorts of tohmat, false accusations. If someone believes that the Imams receive the revelation, then he is kafir, implicitly saying that Shia actually do that. But I just don't want to say that the Shia are kafir. If someone believes that the Quran is corrupted and the real Quran the Mahdi will bring, he is a kafir. But we don't say Shia is kafir. The Rawafid believe that. If someone accuses the wife of the Prophet of adultery, he is a kafir. But Shia are not kafir. What does that mean? False accusations. No Shia believes that. How dare you say this about us? It's of the aqaid of Shia that wives of none of the prophets commit sexual sins. They can betray them by other means, but they never ever commit any sexual sins, whether it is wife of Lut or wife of Nuh or wife of the Holy Prophet or any prophet. But they would use these terms and say Rawafid, Rafidi, Rafidi, Rafidi. And they've started using the word Rafidi in derogatory terms as a reaction to that. Some of us have embraced that term Rafidi and they say, Ana Rafidi, I am Rafidi, I am among the, among the Rawafid. And they have taken that as their identity instead of Shia. While the Shia, the origins of the Shia, I said, where are the roots and origins of the Shia? The origins of the Shia are very old, very old. The Holy Prophet himself used the word Shia. Again, a hadith that is found in both Shia and Sunni sources. Ya Ali anta wa shi'atuka humul faizun. O oh, Ali, you and your Shia, they are going to be successful on the day of judgment. So the word Shia. The roots of Shia are old. They did not start after the Holy Prophet. And in the times of the Holy Prophet, there were people who were known as Shia of Ali, like Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, Ammar, who openly associated with Ali and believed that Ali was going to be the successor of the Holy Prophet. 
And the Holy Prophet throughout his life announced that. I'll get back to Rafidi in a bit, but the, the roots of Shia very quickly. Throughout his life, announced that, in fact, the Holy Prophet announced the succession who was going to be his Khalifa on the very first time he started the work of prophethood openly. There was a three year gap between the first revelation and when Allah ordered him to start the work of the prophethood and then he invited his, his family, his Quraysh, and told them about Allah. At that moment he announced, he asked, who is going to support me in this work, in this course? No one stood up. And when Ali stood up, 10 year old boy, 11 year old boy, the Holy Prophet announced, then, anta khalifati wa waziri, on the very first time, very first day he started the work of prophethood, he announced that. And this is found in both Sunni and Shia sources. So the Shia is not a construct of Abdullah ibn Sabah or the Persian Majus and all those silly accusations. I say to those people, if you cannot come up with something profound, then at least follow the Quran. If you hate us, if you hate us for loving Ali, then at least follow the Quran. And the Quran says, Wala ala Animosity for a people should not make you do injustice to those people. At least be just and don't falsely accuse us. So Rafidi, Rafidi were those people who had left Zayd ibn Ali and Zayd ibn Ali who had risen up against the Umayyads and these people left Zayd ibn Ali and he said, Rafadutu Muni, you have left me. Because those people asked Zayd, what do you think about the first caliph and the second caliph? And Zayd did not talk negatively about them. As a result of that, those people left Zayd. And he said, you have left me, Rafadutu Muni. And those were called the Rafidi. And then these people today, the Shia today, those who like to embrace the identity Rafidi as a reaction to the Takfiris, they say we are Rafidi. No, this is not a correct term. This is not an identity the Holy Prophet gave to you. The Holy Prophet gave to us the identity of Shia, of Ali. And that is what we need to embrace. That is what we are. And just one final point before I get to history and the time is running and I want to just sum up last thing, Ali, Ali, whether you are Shia, whether you are Sunni, we both love Ali. We both love Ali in our own ways. My question is, what is the result of that? Does that even reflect in our behaviors? Does that even show when we interact with other human beings? Do we have the color of Ali? Color. You know, color, there are different birds. Peacock, the birds of heaven, swan, with different beautiful colors. None of them is my favorite. My favorite is raven. Raven. What a majestic bird. So beautiful. Why? From the tip of its beak until its claws, it is completely black not a single dot of any other color. No white, no gray, nothing. Be like raven. Only the color of Ali. Sibratu Ali, Sibratu Muhammad. Sibratu Muhammad, Sibratu Allah. The color of Ali is the color of the Holy Prophet. The color of the Holy Prophet 
is the color of Allah. And Allah says, Sibratullah. And what color is better than the color of Allah? You are Sunni, we are Shia, but we don't have the color of Ali. The color of Ali, the akhlaq of Ali. <laughs> Ali even compromised and went at lengths to cooperate with the caliphs who had taken the caliphate and the government for the greater good of Islam. That's the color of Ali. Was Ali slandering people? Was Ali swearing and abusing people? Was Ali falsely accusing other Muslims? How did he, how did he treat his enemies? Who has the integrity like the integrity of Ali? The Khawarij who called him Kafir. Even with them he was very kind. Very kind, so kind that he would go to their camp and sit with them and argue with them in the kindest of manner. Maw'idha, Hasana, Hikmah. And he won over 4,000 Khawarij back. And even after the battle of Nahrawan, because they forced him into it, when they started to challenge the government, create a lot of fitna and bloodshed, what did he do? After defeating the Khawarij, he let them be. He didn't start a witch hunt. In this world, when someone crushes a movement, they start a witch hunt. They go from door to door to door and kill people, hang them publicly. Ali said, no, they consider me kafir, they have their own beliefs, let them be. As long as they don't become a group and start an armed uprising against the government, let them be. That is the integrity of Ali. And today, how are we treating other human beings? Ali said, Kunu lilwalimi khasman wa lilmazlumi awna the principle of justice, supporting the oppressed and opposing the oppressor, the color of Ali. The leaders of the Sunni world, if they had the color of Ali, they would have supported the oppressed Muslims of the world today, whether in Gaza or in Xinjiang, in China, Uyghurs, or the Rohingya, all Sunni Muslims. But if we Shia claim to be the followers of Ali, if we had the color of Ali, we would support those oppressed people, regardless of their religion, regardless of their school of thought, even if they were non-Muslim. That's the color of Ali. That's the color of Ali. Ali let the Khawarij be, and one of them struck Ali, martyred Ali. When Ali was brought home, his daughters started to lament, started to cry. Sayyida Zainab salamullahi alayha. When she saw her father come home after Ibn Muljim struck him, she lamented, she cried, and people gathered outside the house. Ali said, do not gather outside the house. No one should hear the voice of Zainab. No one should hear the voice of Zainab. But there was a time that Zainab came to Karbala. This very Zainab, 
who was safe in the house of her father, that no one had heard her voice, she came to Karbala. And there was a time when her veils, her veil was snatched in Karbala. After she had been through a lot, after she had lost her brother, her brothers and her two sons, and briefly the eulogy of two sons, Aun and Muhammad. Briefly the eulogy, the time's up, just a couple of minutes. It's not the quantity of masaib that Allah accepts. It's the quality, my brothers and sisters. Just one tear is sufficient. Even one tear is sufficient to extinguish the fire of hell. If with ma'rifah, it is shed with ma'rifah, no quantity. I'll recite only two, three sentences and the majlis is over. On the night of Ashura, Zainab prepared her sons, Aun and Muhammad, to go the next day and fight. The came, then came the day of Ashura, and they would go to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and the Imam did not allow them to go into the battlefields that easily. They insisted, they insisted. You know what Lady Zainab had told them the night before? She had said, if my brother did not let you go to the battlefield, say one thing and he will allow you. You know what was that? They said to Imam Hussain alayhi salam, for the sake of your mother Zahra, allow us to go. The Imam allowed both of them to go to the battlefield. They went there. The grandsons of Ja'far Tayyar fought bravely. Eventually, both of them were martyred. Just one last sentence, one last sentence, one last sentence. When the bodies of both of them were brought to the tent where the bodies of martyrs were lying, Sayyida Zainab did not come out of her tent. She said, it is written in some narrations, she said, I don't want to go and see the bodies of my sons, lest my brother says my condition and feels embarrassed that because of him, because he is here, that I feel this way. She did not want Imam Hussain alayhi salam to feel that way. Allah al-hanatullahi ala al-qamiz walameen. Rabbana walamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunnana minal khasirin. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجهم ونعم أعدائهم أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته